So the stagnant bad water of the world is default from being separated from God. In verse 20 it says that the ground is barren. And the ground is barren also without Christ. Bad water cannot bring life that produces good fruit on the riverbank. Can it? It can't. It actually kills trees. It kills vegetation. In other words, there's no fruit of the Spirit hanging off the unsaved. Their ground is barren. Fruitful in the world's terms, but not truly fruitful. Because even algae grows in stagnant waters. And so algae is a certain kind of fruitfulness that the world gets to partake in. But it's not the real fruit of Christ. It's not the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace. Da, 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 da. It's fake fruit. You might see the people in the world being successful with so many different, so many different avenues. Hey, it's not the fruit of the Spirit. That be kind of vile. Anything that doesn't come from the true vine comes from a fake vine. So the world is in desperate need of a saviour. The church is the salt which carries the spirit of God that needs to deliver Jesus to this barren world, bringing the water of life. Last week we read this about you being the salt, Matthew 5.13. Let's go there. Matthew 5.13 You are the salt of the earth. Jesus' words here. But if the salt loses its flavour, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Remember last week we looked at how Jesus said that you are the salt of the earth. Those who were here, you are the salt, meaning that uh, you are already the salt, right? Um, like, you're not going to be the salt. If you're a Christian, you're, you are the salt. You're not becoming salt. You can't become salt. You can't attain salt. <laughs> Once you're a Christian, you are salt. And you've got to capture this because that's the only way to live this life. You've got to know that you are the answer. You're not will be. You're not becoming the answer. You're not... One day, you're not attaining something. You've got to know that you already are. You are the salt. You are the answer. You do carry Christ now. You are anointed now. Not will be. You are. See, if you think you've got to, yo, oh, I'm going to attain a certain saltiness, it's never going to happen. You will outlive that thought because tomorrow never comes. And that attaining thing that you're going for will never work out. Soul is not something that you can attain. I'm not talking about holiness here either. But he said that you are already the soul of the earth. And so God wants your soul to turn the world upside down. And this we see in the early church. You know, they were turning the world upside down. <coughs> Miracles were abounding. Healings were abounding, people were being raised from the dead, salvation saved 3,000 in one day. The church was multiplying in the early church. And the government at that time didn't know how to handle the power that the church was manifesting and operating in. The government was losing its influence over society because they were turning the world upside down. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 6 to 8. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren uh, to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harboured them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. 
and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. These early disciples were turning the world upside down. Turn to your neighbor and say, how are you going with that? Are you turning the world upside down? The church was turning the world upside down. Our prayer is for God to turn the world upside down. But see, your life is a salt shaker. And God wants to turn you upside down first. To shape the world within you so that your salt will be shaken out into the world around you. But God wants to shape your world so that he can shape the world that is around you. He's got some work for you to do. He's called you the salt. Now he's saying, come on, you are the salt shaker of this time. You are the salt shaker of the day. Will you release? Will you shake? Turn over and say, shake, shake, shake. Stand up and shake your booty. No, you <laughs> God wants you to shake. God wants you to shake. You're a salt shaker. He wants to shake the salt out of you. He wants you to make a difference on earth. The first thing I want to say, first point number is here, is let God sort out your salt. Even though you're a salt shaker, often the salt has trouble getting out. Am I right? Impurities get in the salt. Moisture clogs up the salt holes in the salt shaker, doesn't it? The salt's not free enough to get out. You've been to a restaurant, you know, and it's got the salt shaker, and it's not coming out. At home it's okay, you can whack that thing on the table a few times and get that thing working. In a restaurant, it's a little bit more discreet, you know, tap it on your palm and it doesn't really. You've got to whack it on something to get the salt moving. Sometimes God's got to give us a bit of a whack. If we're stuck in the world or, you know, uh, you know, caught up in the world, the system of the world, sometimes God's going to give us a bit of a whack to get reconnected with Him. God's going to get on the inside of us to sort out the, the clogged salt that's on the inside of us. They reckon you can put some rice into a salt shaker and shake it up and it gets the salt shaking again right. Is that right, true? Yeah. They reckon drop a, an iPhone into a into some water, you put that in the bag and throw a heap of rice in it. Does that work? It's a no, that rice it's a in salt, I think it might work in the salt shakers, I don't know. But just like rice can get in the salt shaker and get it moving freely, God's got to get into the salt shaker in the body of Christ and get the salt moving freely again. There's some things on the inside of us that God wants to, to free us from. Insecurities. Fear of rejection. The busyness of life. The attending to other things. See, these clog the holes for the salt to flow out of. When you add God to the salt shaker, it begins to free us up to where, even though we're salt, not only are we salt, but we can be free to let it come out. When you add God into salt, he gets to free up the salt. It can come out of your life and touch the world. So I don't know where, like, where your life is today, but you know, if, if you've got no time for God, I bet you the salt's clogged up. You've got to get God in, you've got to, got to get connected with him. So if you're not connected with him right now, you better do that. That is your first priority, your relationship with him. He must, he must be your forever connection point in life. He is your central point. You cannot allow yourself to become disconnected to God. 
to Jesus. You know, he is your freeing agent. Let God into those areas. Make sure you spend good time with him. Quality time. Give him the chance to free up the soul in your life. The second thing is that you need to do is you need to shake your shaker. Shake your shaker, but what if my what if I'm my shaker's clogged up? You know what? The only way you find if a shaker is clogged up is you just start shaking the shaker first. Is that right? How do you know if the salt shaker is clogged up? Just start shaking. You know, don't wait for your life to be perfect and have all your ducks in a row and everything's everything's really cool and you know the finances are going cool before you start shaking the salt. Shake your shaker now, and if it's clogged, then get before God to get him to clean that area up, right? Just start shaking. If it's not clogged, keep shaking it. See, Elisha, he pulled the trigger on this miracle here. Didn't he? He actually kick-started the miracle. Was he looking for a sign? Oh, oh no, oh, a sign. Where's the sign? No, no. He threw the salt into the water. He wasn't seeking a sign. He was the sign. He carried the sign. He had the salt. He was the sign uh, of the time that was going to change the situation in that water there. And you're the sign for those around you right now. God wants to use you as salt to impact and change the lives around you right now. Don't wait for a perfect time to start releasing your salt. Let it go now. Let people judge you. Let people say, oh, he's a fake Christian man. You should see, you know, I know some things about him. Too bad. We're shaking the salt out, man. We may not be perfect, but we're going to release the anointing of God. You wait wait till you're perfect. You'll never do it. You'll never shake your shaker if you're waiting for perfection. Yeah, we're all on that road. Don't get me wrong. God wants us holy, and we're all on that road. But don't wait until you're completely holy because you know what? You'll be waiting until you're in heaven and it's, oh yeah, now I'm ready. Too late. You need to rest on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You need to hang on his righteousness and just start shaking your salt shaker out and touching people's lives. Come on, miracles from your life. Healing power of God from you. Come on, just see some people raised from the dead this year. Have got one to go. Come on, miracles, Amen. salvations. Let's release the power of God upon Logan City and around your area, your life, those that you're in contact with. Come on, even the cool people. Come on, God wants to touch you. Shake your shaker. Don't let religious Christians tell you you're not ready to shake your shaker. You know, might not be ready for certain functions in the body of Christ, but you are ready to shake your shaker, man. You might need to grow to become a certain, uh, to, to fulfill a certain role in the body of Christ. I'm not saying that against that. But you are ready to shake your shaker. You know that most people that are fruitful are the ones that just get saved notice that? I mean, when I got saved, I saw my brother get saved, I saw my uh, mother and father get saved not long, not long after that. Man, I've seen so many people get saved just after I got saved. What was I doing? I just thought, oh, well, I'm a salt shaker. I wasn't really thinking that, but that's, that's all I was doing. I was just shaking my shaker. I go in the park, stand on a park bench and start preaching Jesus. Everyone left the park. And I was shaking my shaker. Well, and I were in Queen Street Mall just the other day, and there was a African guy up in the uh, up in the, the uh, I don't know some area where people can do. It's up at the top there. It's preaching Jesus. I thought, man, how awesome is that? 
So I went to tell I got some money out and gave it to him. Just blessed him. I thought, man, you keep doing that. You keep doing that, man. Don't let. You know what? Some of, <laughs> anyone comes up, comes in our church with fire, I never pour water on them. I'm like looking for the petrol. Let's light them up, man. <laughs> Let's throw a fuel on these people. Huh? Better than being an old stooge trying to stamp people out. You won't put an old head on young shoulders. Let them grow the old head. Let them make their own mistakes. Well, to a degree, right? The Spirit of God inspired Elijah. Elisha. And then Elisha did something about that. See, he's like, let's get this treaty between me and God in action. So Elisha pulled the trigger on his, on his salt shaker, or his salt bowl. Then he went out to the spring and cast salt in it. Shake your shaker. Lukewarm Christians want to wait and see. But full-on Christians just step out and believe. It's true. They initiate the miracle. They initiate the salvations. They're shaking their shaker. Number three, um, shake your shaker fervently. Be deliberate. Be fervent. Elisha pulled the trigger with vigour. Right? He was very deliberate about this miracle. He wasn't mucking around about it. He was sold out on it. In fact, in verse 21, uh, it says that he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt. And that word cast in the Hebrew actually means a few things. To throw out or to hurl or to fling. There was something deliberate about the way that he that he uh, got the salt from the bowl and into the water. He was deliberate about it. He was serious about it. He made a decision to do it and he was all in on his decision. It's powerful. A, a, a person that is uh, dedicated to their decision is a powerful person. It's kind of like he just says, well, I'm going to do this. You can just like rest assured, oh gee, he's going to get that done then. <laughs> How'd you like to be a person like that? You know, I'm going to do this by next year. And then you know that person's going to actually get that done. He is dedicated to his decision. And when you make a decision, you need, that needs to be loaded with dedication. So when you say you're going to do something, it happens. It's going to happen. Just like God was a, a God is a God of his word. Jesus was a man of his word. He said it was going to happen. It happened. And you and I, we carry the same spirit that Jesus did. So when we make a decision, we can be fervent about it and make that sure that it happens. Hello. Hello. You start shaking the spirit world when you start living like that. The devil will start being fearful of you and start backing away from your life when you live like that. When your decisions are packed with commitment. It's the last thing the devil wants from your life. The last thing the devil wants from your life is fervency about what you have decided to do. Oh, I don't know, guys. Is this okay? Come on, God's lifting us up, isn't he? Good, Vlad. Like it. God's lifting us. He throws the salt in it. He's not just sprinkling it. Oh, we'll give it a bit of a go then. We'll give it a go. How many of us make decisions and we... I'll give it a go. See what happens. No, no. If I'm giving it a go, I'm making it happen. That's how you live life. That's how we need to live. Are we going to get a car? Get a car! 
I'm going to get a job. Get a job. Don't make a decision if you're not going to, if it's not going to be loaded with a commitment. Hello. You're better off making a small decision and committing to that decision rather than making a big one and not committing to it. Jesus said, if you're faithful in the small, I will give you much. If I'm faithful in the little, God will give me bigger. And so it is in life. It's how we live. It's how we should live. It's how Jesus lived. So he throws the soul in. There's a fervency about the miracle. It's, it's like he's not trying for a miracle. Give it a bit of a go. He's doing the miracle. He's purposeful about the miracle. He wasn't like, just pour it in, see what happens. See, you need to be... James 5, 16. Let's go there. James 5, 16. Says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer... You like that? The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. See, if I have the odd tote now and then, as an example, right? If I pray the effective, fervent prayer against that, I believe that my, if that's loaded with commitment and dedication, that decision, that I'm actually going to give that up, that will empower me with the Spirit of God to actually give that up. It's the Spirit of God that empowers you to have that kind of dedication to a decision. And our prayers can be so forceful in the Spirit that you know they're going to happen. When you start giving a habit in your life and you say something's going to happen and you get that thing and make sure that that thing happens, just see how powerful your prayers become too. Your prayers become fervent. You force things to take place in the spirit. The devil cannot stop the fervent prayer of a righteous man. Nor can he stop the fervent decision of a righteous man. Hey guys, how you going? The unfervent prayer of a righteous man probably avails little. Though. So the unfervent prayer may look like a take it or leave it prayer, a whatever prayer. We'll see what happens. We're believing it, but, you know, just in case. The fervent prayer is powerful, it's focused, it's purposeful, it's full of intent. You are bringing God to the problem. Your prayer is loaded with dedication. The fourth thing this morning is shake your shaker at the source of the problem. Or whatever it is that you're throwing salt on. See, Elisha threw the salt at the source. You missed that, didn't you, when you read that? Let's read it. Verse 21. Then he went out to the source of the water. We got that one there? He went out to the source of the water and cast the salt there. See, he didn't just throw the salt anywhere. He went to the source. What problem do you need God to touch? in your life or around your life. Don't pray for the cat then. Pray at the source. Commit prayer and resources and your commitment and dedication at the source. Then it's fervent. Then it's deliberate. Then it's powerful. You are God, you're bringing God onto it. Elijah's bringing God into the source here. 
to change the water, the situation. He targeted the source at the issue, where it was coming from. So they found out where the problem was, it was making the water bad, oh, throw it there. He threw it at the source. If you have a fear of rejection, throw salt at the source. If you get discouraged a lot, throw salt at that source. You've got to learn how to keep yourself encouraged. If discouragement is one that keeps knocking you out, throw salt at discouragement. See how it works? You've got to get good. You've got to understand, you know, you might have some, you know, personality kind of weaknesses you know, that, that you might have. So you've got to understand who you are and where your weaknesses might be so that you can throw salt at the source. Guys. Is this okay? Listen to this. Elisha didn't pray for healing for that water. He prophesied. He didn't just pour out a little bit of salt and say, let's just pour out a little bit and test the miracle first to, so that my name is like protected if it doesn't work out. The salt didn't heal the water before it was thrown in. It healed the water after it was thrown in. But God's waiting for you to throw some salt on some things around your life to throw some salt on some things over people's lives around you. Bring them to Christ, things in your own life. Come on, you've got to get deliberate about them. He wasn't mucking around. You've got to start prophesying over some things in your own life. Be bold, stand up, do it, declare war upon those things that are in your life so that God can use you to a greater degree. He wants more salt coming out of you. Christians wait for the perceived perfect moment to minister to people, to pray for people. Many Christians are waiting for the iron to be hot. When Jesus said the fields are already white, and Paul says that we are already anointed, and he said to Timothy, we preach in and out of season. The time to throw salt is now. Today. This moment, while the anointing has got you right now, now's the time to make some decisions about your life, about some salt. Maybe you've got some you know, clogged, up, clogged up holes that are blocking the soul on the inside of you. Come on, we should make some decisions right now. So it can be released. <clears throat> Not a matter of striking when the iron's hot. It's a matter of striking because the iron is already hot. God often waits for us to step out before he does things. Moses was backed up against the Red Sea, remember that? Moses like, oh, what, what, what do I do? Surely God's going to do something. God says, what's in your hand? God's like, use your rod. Open up the sea yourself. Moses' iron was already hot. He didn't realise it until God said, stretch it out. <coughs> God didn't fly Israel to the promised land on a magic carpet. Although he could have, right? Why didn't he? Because he's not, he's not just interested in getting us into the promised land. He, wa he wants to build a person to arrive into the promised land shining, victorious, ruling and reigning in life and winning in Christ. So we're carrying the anointing and winning and being victorious. That's why God didn't carry them, you know, on a magic carpet. God, want, God wanted them to believe him and to, to uh, stand, stand firm knowing that God was with them. That's what God wanted. God wanted them to believe him. And while they did that, he would have taken them right in and dealt with all their enemies. 
God's way is believe and see. The only reason that miracles are missing in action is because Christians are missing in action. Yeah. But Elijah, he had to initiate the miracle here. He did that by throwing the salt in the water. So for the miracle to work out, he had to outwork the miracle. You are the soul. The water represents the world. The salt represents you and me. And God wants to throw the soul into the world to bring it to himself, to heal it, and to be the answer. Keys. Please, keys, please. You have to wear them too, do you? Jesus. This is where it all begins, right? I spoke about the water of the world and the water of the word. And while the water of the world is, is our vine, whatever that's happening to Christians, you know, whatever the, the water of the world is, the vine, it's the sustenance, it's what we live from, we're missing out on the water of the word, you see? It's the water of the word that's got to get on the inside. Free up the salt so that it can be released in those areas in our lives and those around us. It's him, eh? It's him. It's him. Spoke about fruitfulness is a perceived fruitfulness that the world has. It's not the fruit of the Spirit, guys. You might see successful people in the world, but it's not the fruit of Christ. We can all be, anyone can be successful. You just apply some of God's principles and they'll always work. But to truly be a follower of Christ is to be connected to the true vine and to be truly fruitful from that vine. You know, on this morning here, I'm not sure if everyone's here, but the first thing you've got to do if you've been living from the, you know, the, uh, the water of the world is that you've got to, got to come back and commit to the water of the word. Maybe you're just not reading the word. Maybe, maybe you're, not, you're not praying. Maybe you're not reading the word. Maybe you're not abiding in the vine. But then you're grabbing and you're being ministered to by the world. This and that and that. It's kind of like keeping you entertained and consumed and focused. And you, you've got this you know, way of life where you kind of like getting by without Jesus. You can't do that as a Christian. You've got to, you've got to commit your all to him, you know. You gotta give 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 over completely. It's really true. And so this morning, just before we finish, I just want to uh, maybe um, if anyone this morning, if you you've been caught up, the water of the world has been what you're drinking from. You know, if that's you this morning, I'd love you to just come to the front and I'd love to pray for you. And uh, let's believe together. I'd love you to make a a brand new decision, not a born again decision, but just a new decision to, to uh, now drink from the word. Forsake the world 
and live in the word, hey? If that's you this morning, would you hop out of your seat and come? Lord, thank you, Jesus. Things can become, you know, can, can, can become a place in our lives instead of instead of God, hey? Can I abide in something, you know? Some guys love love cars, you know, it's like they're mechanics, they just live, you know, they, they don't worry about golden calf, they've got a golden car. And all their life is around this car. Guess what that is? It's it's golden calf. It's it's um this it's not a sin in the sense that they're doing anything wrong, but their heart is in the wrong place, right? It's um it's taken the place of God. It's it's a fake vine that they live from. They they love to fix the radiator because the, fixing the radiator gives them a sense of importance, and they they, they get a sense of you know where that maybe they've been told as a kid that they're useless, and so they fix a radiator so that they can tell themselves, oh I'm not useless, I can do something. See that? And every time they they do a little successful thing on their car, it. it it forms a, a form of idolatry where this person comes around and he gets their life and their sustenance, their entertainment out of the, the car. I know I'm speaking truth. I had to give over my guitar. Uh, when I first came to the Lord, I used to play my guitar eight hours a day. Eight hours a day, I could not walk past the music shop without going in there and picking up a Strat or a Telecaster. And you know what I'm talking about. Just the feel of it. When I came to Christ, my guitar was my vine. It was my, it was my idol. God said to me one day, you know, in Korea, he says, you've you got you to hang that thing up for a while. I'm like, what, what, what? Oh, surely it's not a sin. I'm trying to find out, you know, uh, where is it a sin to play guitar? <laughs> it's not there. You won't find it. But it, it had a place in my heart that, that, uh, that captured my heart and I found life there. I found entertainment there. I found, I found that I was, I was fruitful in that little area of my life there. Yeah. And God said, hang it up. I did hang it up for quite a few years. I've got no issue now playing the guitar. God gave it, gave it back to me. So it's not a problem now, you can have it. It's like, oh, too late, Lord, I don't really need it now. <laughs> gave it up. There's a lot of little things can become the water of the, the world. Huh? It's not that they're sinful, it's just that they've taken the wrong place. God's got to be in that centre spot. Yeah. Is there any, anyone else this morning? Come on, come, come, come.
leader, I just see like a pack of cards and, uh, you know, it's like just a reshuffling of what should be on top. And just like bang, 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 like an order. Yeah, going on. God, right now. Jesus. Amen. God's good, eh? Come on, let's pray. God, we thank you, Lord, this morning. God, each and every one of us, God, that, that you would be the centre. Lord, that you'd always be the centre of our place, of our life, of our heart. God, God, be salt shakers. Letting your spirit move around us and in us. God, touching this area. God, in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, God's good, hey? Let's give him a clap, hey? Jesus. Well, bless you guys. Uh, now, is there something... Kelvin...